Dopey Radio. One more question about China. So how bad is the pollution? Well, apparently it's better actually since I was there, but but how could it be better within only a few years? Oh no, they've been cut, they've been shutting down all the factories. They literally made a concerted effort. To really? Shut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I did get word back from like some Westerners that lived there that actually it's improved quite a bit. But on the bad days, it was really bad. Like you could almost taste it. Uh, would you then, go outside on the bad days? Well, I would because you just like you just got to get on with life. But I wouldn't exercise or do anything too strenuous on the bad days. And was it just a fog, like a brown yeah, fog? Yeah, it would just look like it would just look like a very gray day, but right. it was pollution. Right. And then you would pray for wind or rain. Windy days there was no pollution. Right. Uh, but so there would be periods of time, but it's like the weather forecast, you would know that it was going to be shitty. Right. And it you know, it was what it was, you know. So when the Asians walk around uh, New York with their masks on, do you laugh at them like this is nothing compared to where you can Yeah, but wh- sometimes they're doing that because they're prone out about germs. Oh, really? It's more yeah, germs than pollution? Yeah, sometimes it's germs. And uh, apparently today's a bad pollution day in New York. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's well, nothing, yeah. Like, yeah. nothing like China. Uh, so Like in New York, a horrific day is like 40 right. on the whatever it is, PM 2.5 or whatever they call that number. It, a bad day in Beijing was 400. Jeez. Yeah, I had a 400 day when I was there. Wow. Disgusting. Are you just uh, gasping for air at that point? It's just, you can taste it on the back of your oh throat. Oh my God. Are, and are they germaphobes in China in general? Or No. <laughs> that is one thing they are not. <laughs> it's filthy there. Right. It's oh. dirty, but you just learn to live with that. Yeah. Although they always take their shoes off when they go in the house, but you have to. Like, it is dirty. Right. So you went backwards, which is fine. So I wanted to start from your beginning. So you're, you're in Flushing... Um, Queens, and then at 14, they ship you off to Ireland. Yeah, I flunked out of St. Francis Prep, which Ooh. is just like a Catholic high school there. And uh, just, I, I wasn't really that interested. I was actually being bullied, but that wasn't a word at the time. Right. And uh, by some of those fucking goombas from Howard Beach. And they, they, were, a, they were a big clique, and I, I fell foul with them. And there was, there was some, there was some gaudies in that clique, which added to the... Uh, Added to the fear factor. Oh, that's why they shipped you out. Now it all makes sense. Well, no, actually, well, if you're close to like gaudy people, and well, I wasn't. I mean, but he, he you know, the, they were in the neighborhood, though. He, no, he was in that clique of people that I fell foul of in St. Okay. Francis Prep. You know, it was over a girl, and uh, so anyway, that was fine. You know, just natural teenage bullying. But you know, I was a little bit afraid. But that that sort of fizzled out before. But all that stress, I wasn't too interested in studying. Plus, it was like the graffiti days, and I was a little bit into like graffiti and early days of drinking and so it was just like a load of shit going on that I really shouldn't have been involved in and when I flunked out my mother was like freaking out that I was going to end up really screwed up my cousin had ended up like with some issues right around that time and she was like he's going to be one you know he's going to turn out like him right and in the midst of all this fear a cousin of mine put the idea into my head to go to Ireland and I said it to my mother I was like what about Ireland to go to boarding school and she kind of like wasn't really too wild about it but when we looked into it it was pretty cheap and my mother says today that her feeling at the time was I was gonna be fucked up regardless so I might as well be fucked up there where it's probably safer than being fucked up in New York who knows because you can never say what would have happened she may or may not have been right but it certainly was good for me because I got into education immediately when I got there. So were you living with family there? Or? So I would stay with cousins at the weekends. Oh, okay. And then in boarding school during the week. And it was kind of like a shitty boarding school. It wasn't like fancy. And it was like really rural. Right. And it was really the opposite of New York City. Right. And it, it kind of made me as an individual. And I, 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 it's hard to say whether I would have been a comedian or not because I was always a bit of a performer. But certainly like... All that experience of fish out of water, seeing this other side of Ireland, seeing all these characters, all those characters were the early parts of my comedy career, right. which made me successful fairly quickly. So I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't done that, but it kind of, a lot of my life stems from the experience of right. being chucked into that. How cool is Ireland? It's a great country. I've never I mean, been. I, I've never, uh, I would never not have had that life. Right. You know, it seems weird now because I'm back in New York and I feel like a bit of a New Yorker again. But really, I'm way more Irish. I mean, I've spent way more of my life there. Yeah. All my friends are there. From 14 to what age? To, like, I mean, I still have a place in Dublin. But Do you really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, in my mind, I still kind of live there. Do you but... go there once a year, twice a year? Oh, I go there all the time. Oh, you do? I haven't completely let go of my Irish life. Oh, okay. I'm just trying to... This trip here is a professional move, not, a, not, a, right. not like a life move. 
So, so there's a good chance you would just go back to Ireland oh, and, yeah. and call it a day. Absolutely. And live there. No kidding. Which is not good because that no, maybe well, fucks that leads up your motivation. To, I think you were, uh, I'm trying to do the math here. Look, weren't you like 19 or 20 when you stopped drinking? 19, yeah. 95. The last drink I ever had was right here. Right, right, hit, right here? Literally right here. Oh, so the grapefruit beers I brought aren't, aren't going to go over. No, well. but there is a. I meant to offer you Corona. <laughs> no, we were no, like, I'm we're, it was hard to be a good host because we were <laughs> no, already recording, you know. But there's Coronas in the fridge that I won't drink. <laughs> right. So uh, anyway, uh, so you're in Ireland, and that's when you realize I got to stop drinking. Well, 17. Actually, the first. I mean, I mean, I, I I started drinking at 12. I started getting in trouble with drinking when I was 14. Got caught like pissing in this fireplace that we're sitting in front of, and you know, just stupid shit when you're a teenager. But it was always never going to work out with me. Both my parents stopped drinking before I was born, bad alcoholics. Uh, a lot of people in my family, bad alcoholics. It was just kind of clear from very early on that every time I drank, bad shit happened. Yeah. Blacked out early, all that shit. So, but when I was 16, in, you know, going on 17, that's when, like, I started having, like, these violent blackouts. So, like, not blackouts like, oh, dude, you passed out on the street last night. Blackouts where, like, I would fucking end up in total chaos. Really? Bad fights. Like, I was just one of, you know, one of those guys, the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde guys. Right. Why, I have no idea. If there's some suppressed anger, I don't know. But I would black out, and when I would come out of that blackout, I would be in fucking chaos. Can I, I gotta stop you for a second. Like, I don't understand blacking out. Like, I. Well, thank God. No, I. <laughs> Well, I, I guess you either have it or don't, because I, I certainly had my drinking years. Yes. And I, I, I drank to excess, passing out and all that. But when people talk about blacking out, that scares the fuck out of me, because I don't understand the concept that you're totally not aware of what's happening at that moment. Like, even if you're really fucked up, you're kind of aware, and, and you're still connected to reality. Well, I'll give you one example, because yeah, this, this one's a vivid one for me. I have plenty of them, but this one is vivid. I was a doorman on West 23rd Street in my summer job when I was a teenager, right? And so when I would come back to New York for the summer, and I remember one time I worked at 3 to 11, and my cousin was having a party, my first cousin. So I rushed back to their house, no drinks. I hadn't had any drinks. Get to their house about midnight, I start drinking. And I guess I was like rushing it because I was behind everybody, and everything was going good. And then lights out, right? I don't know what time, lights out. And the next thing I know, I, I come out of it, and I'm being held back by like three people and there's this guy in front of me and I don't know why, but I punch him in the face. But I remember punching him in the face. But I don't know why I've just, you wow. know, I, I guess I, I'm afraid, you know, yeah. but I punch him in the face and he's like, why are you fucking hitting me? I'm trying to help you, this wow. guy says. And then I came to a bit and the violence kind of stopped, but I was still super drunk. But it, I was told after the fact that just for no reason out of nowhere, I started trying to hit everybody. Wow. I mean, that's horrible. I hate saying that. Did about anyone myself. ever tell you why you wanted to hit everybody? Did they no, fill in the I, blanks it for you? It would happen all the time, man. Yeah, I, I, I don't know wild. what it was about. I, I, whether it was like, you know, like Native Americans have a problem with booze and, you know, like it doesn't suit the, you know, it doesn't suit them physically. Or, you know, is, it, is that some sort of weird reaction or is it like a suppressed anger that you don't know about? Yeah. But I, I had uncountable scenarios like that. The reason, the first time I went to an AA meeting, where I was 17, and I went with my dad, but the reason was because the night before, in a blackout, I kicked the shit out of my best friend, and I didn't know why. Jeez. But, but it, it, it was, I won't bore you with the story, but it was more problematic than that, because I was flying out to New York the next day. Right. And my bag and my passport was in his brother's office in Dublin because oh, I had got shit. it. So I had to see him the next day, the shame of it. They had to come in to get me my stuff. I mean, it was really horrible, but I felt, I couldn't believe that I had done this. Right. So that was the first time I went to, uh, to an AA meeting with my dad. And of course, I was like, hey dad, I'll just go with you. <laughs> right. But I guess he kind of knew. But anyway, from 17 to 19, I, 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 I started trying to stop because the, it was the violence, man. Like, like, that's I could have kept. I could have kept drinking for years. Yeah, but I was just like friends dropping like flies and like real danger shit. That's you know? that's incredible insight to know at seventeen to nineteen that you, you can't. Well, drink my, my parents had been in my head though. Like I think if I hadn't, if my parents weren't sober alcoholics, I probably wouldn't have thought that it was. So you recognize this behavior, or they were your, in my head parents. all the time gotcha. saying I I have a problem. Right. So they they, they are the ones that told me I was an alcoholic. When I was fourteen, and how did it? How did it finally stick? Because you said from seventeen to nineteen, you were like, and I don't know. I just was finally stuck, man. Like I think it was just 
I got lucky and sort of followed what they were telling me to do, the sober people were telling me to do, you know? Right. But after 17, 17 to 18, I was stopping trying to drink. Then 18, I really went into the, the, the rave drugs. You know, I really, and when I started taking drugs, I no longer got violent. I was like, I solved the problem. <laughs> problem solved. <laughs> well, but, but that didn't last very long because then I just like, uh, which, which drugs, ecstasy? Well, mostly or? just ecstasy and LSD and you speed. You went LSD? Well, it was cheap. It was five pounds. Uh, I, an yeah. ecstasy tablet in, in Ireland at that time was uh, 30 pounds. Right. Which was about like $50. Right. So uh, LSD, you could get a, a hit of acid for five, five pounds. And that would keep you going for like five times as long as ecstasy. Can you explain LSD to me? Because You've I, never taken it? I had My partying went as far as, uh, you know... It, I mean, uh, the 80s was cocaine. It was everywhere. I never really liked that. But uh, the first I ever well, went... I was just lucky that I never had the money nor the access to cocaine. Yeah, honestly, I was doing uh, cocaine in Western New York, Geneseo, Rochester, Buffalo. We weren't getting the real shit. To, I, I don't think I actually... Well, they actually, weren't getting it in Ireland either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it was, it was this stuff that was cut with everything. I never really liked it. But the furthest I went was uh, shrooms. Oh, yeah. Well, they used to grow in our boarding school. They used to grow the shrooms? No, they actually just grew naturally in Ireland before the first frost. Really? So like from September... And you, know, you knew which ones yeah, would get yeah. you? Yeah, to... yeah. I used to do shrooms in boarding school all the time. But then you pick one mushroom and you could kill yourself. Nah. You gotta know these, what you're doing with the, those mushrooms. They were everywhere, man. Really? These shrooms were everywhere, yeah. yeah how's, we, L- how's LSD? Because I hear that's a little... Honestly, for me... LSD was just like more intense shrooms, but it's been a long time. It's hard for me to remember. All I know is I loved it. I remember the first time I took LSD was with my buddy. I won't name him, but uh, he'll probably listen to this. And I was 16 years old, and uh, we played NHL 92. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> On the Sega Master System. I guess it was Genesis. I, I, I a Mega Genesis. Drive, maybe Mega Drive. Yeah, yeah. And. Uh, uh, I remember when I, I came up on it, I remember saying to him, I was like, oh, I get it now. I get music. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, wow, the Zeropa, the, like the Zeropa, they're on drug. Like I, I, I really thought everything came from LSD. I'm a huge U2 fan and I never got into Zeropa, so maybe I should have done some LSD. <laughs> That was a that was a tough anim, uh, album to digest. Yeah, I, I can't. I don't know if I'm I'm right on the time. I, I just remember thinking. No, that, I'm just trying to come up with a joke, but it is the truth. That's one of the only U2 albums I don't like. And uh, I I heard Led Zeppelin in like a new way, and and Pink Floyd, like everything just made sense to me at that moment. I believe it though. All those artists were on all sorts Possibly. of shit when they were making all that great but music. I, so. so LSD just gives you a sense that everything makes sense, but also. It, it, it is. It is. There's like a weird, intense feeling, which has been so long. It's very hard for me to, to, to feel it. But I, I used to love the, 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 the. I guess like almost like the most intense tickling you could ever imagine, but okay. more like an internal tickling. Wow. Like your, like your soul was being tickled. Right. And it was just almost like unbearable, but like amazing at the same time. See, that's what I want to ask you about because I've gotten uh, spiritual in the last few years and I, I'm, I'm going down that path uh, pretty heavy duty these days. And they talk about some of these uh, mind altering drugs like well, LSD where, into, you, uh, what where you feel like you, you, I mean, you understand the universe or you, you see, truly see God or really get in touch with your, with your, uh, your soul. Yeah, I mean, I, I see a lot of people doing this. What do they call a ha- Oh, the Hiawatha. Hi- Hiawa- whatever yeah, yeah, the yeah. word is. I, I want to say Hiawatha, but I'm sure that's wrong. But And I've done, uh, in my sobriety slash cleanness, I've done um, uh, altered, like the concept of getting to an altered state to release trapped emotion or to better right. be connected with yourself, but not with drugs, with breathing techniques. Meditation. And atmosphere. Well, actually, one of them was called hol- holotropic breath work. But it was all based around breathing and uh, oxygenating your brain. Right. Anyway. I, Do you I meditate? Yeah, well, it's part of the, it, the, it's the 12 very, steps, you know? Right. So I got into it through that. Do you like it? Though? I'm not a great meditator at the moment, though. I still do when I kind of have a moment and I say, oh, I should try to breathe. It's hard. 
And most people go, I don't meditate because I, I can't focus or whatever. But you got to stick with it. You got to stick with it's it. It's hard. But the it, mind when is when like it, a glass of muddy water. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know that yeah, one? Yeah. They actually use it in Kung Fu Panda. But I had read it in a Tibetan book before. But Kung Fu Panda, the, the master said with him, if you keep stirring it, it will remain cloudy. Right. <laughs> but when it works, you know, it keeps me calm. It keeps my shit well, together. Well, the thing about meditation for me is you can call it spiritual or you can call it whatever. I don't. It, it's scientific to me. If if you quieten the mind, you will have more emotional balance because your thinking affects 100%. your emotions. Your emotions affects your thinking. Right. So if you can quiet the mind, you quiet your emotions, and you will have more right. emotional balance. And the less wound up you are, the better you deal with situations. Right. That's just like a simple fact of life. I'll share a little bit with you. So I'm born, you know, Catholic, organized religion, pretty heavy duty. I hate organized religion. I'm not. I'm not. I don't know if what you believe, but I'm just no. Saying, I'm, 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 I don't I, believe in organized religion. I hate organized religion, but it also bothered me as I was getting older. Uh, getting older, like I have no like you know religious foundation anymore in my life. I just couldn't look at the the Catholic faith and go, yeah, this is for me anymore. So, but uh, meditation and yoga and all that, like it speaks to me, like uh, you know spirituality in general. You, you live spirituality like when you're when you're into organized religion you're not really living it you're trying to learn it and, yeah you're following a and set of rules you're, and you're trying to follow rules that maybe you don't necessarily agree with and finally um, with all that uh, you know being more more spiritual I got a long way to go I'm not trying to oversell this I, I feel like I finally got some kind of foundation back in my life yeah I mean it definitely helps to get something especially because you've had like, like, like life changes the last couple of years so that's always a good time to find it right because yeah no then, kidding then you can say Okay, what 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 is it all about for well, me? Well, well, whether I, it's spiritual or not, it doesn't matter. Everybody has to have a moment where they decide who they are. I think the the things that happened to me over the years needed to happen because I, I took this as I'm holding this microphone in front of you really, really seriously, and I didn't have a balance in my life. I was really good at this and and had incredible success, but I was miserable because I didn't have a balanced life. So when when I lost my job the last time, a, a little over a year ago, I finally had to go. What the fuck? You need you need real balance in your life. I still love doing this, and I'm this podcast is a lot of fun. But I don't take it as seriously as I did all those years doing radio. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people go through that with their careers. I think the world that we're in, this kind of like public uh, entertainment world, right? It can be more intense, and actually, it you can. It can feel like it matters more than it does. Yes. Because your sense of self-worth and your yes. sense of identity gets completely tied up in it. Yes. Which is bad. Right. Because then you're you're reliant on the reactions of others for your sense of yeah. well-being. And and I mean, we're only human in the end. It feels good when yeah, people it feels are like, great. I listen to your podcast. It's awesome. Or, or I, 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 you know, I think you're funny and I love your stand-up, whatever. But man, I really believe if you don't have more of a balance in your life, uh, eventually that will destroy you. No, I, totally, man. Absolutely. But also, you know, the Buddhists say the practice of non-attachment. You know, this sense that when something gets taken away from you, if it leaves you completely empty, like that's negative. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have some sort of balance, then the thing that you're leaning on when it gets taken away, it can be pretty hollow. I was lost, but then I was relieved. And then I realized this was uh, an opportunity. I really believe there was an opportunity finally to wake the fuck up and realize all the other things I got going in my life that are that should be just as important. Yeah, so I mean, I'm working I, toward that. I, I think I'm getting close now, finally. But you know, I had that with booze when I was younger, really? and then I had it as well with a bad, bad breakup, engagement breakup. But probably with my professional life, I think I still chase. If I'm being on, if I'm ratting myself out here at our little meeting. <laughs> 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 if, if I'm going to be honest, since you're being honest, well, then, I probably still chase a little bit. Like, you know, I still look for uh, professional advancement as a sense, as the thing that needs to happen rather than I'm completely content regardless. Oh, no, I, I don't I don't see this, that there's anything wrong with that. But you, I think I think the importance is you have the awareness that 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 is part of what makes you yeah yeah you. Well, yeah awareness is great but 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 you know but I, I'm also probably still not a hundred percent yeah I mean I I think I think that uh, because I have this American thing in my mind right uh, like it will feel like a failure if that doesn't advance so that I, I think like that I don't know if that's positive or negative I well you, I like your honesty you you know that's that's where you are right now with your life so um, but man in Ireland. 
and not drinking. That's crazy. Yes and no. Is it know. is it a huge drinking culture? No, like, it is a huge drinking culture. Like, I actually made I mean, a TV. I made a four episode TV documentary about Ireland's relationship with alcohol. Didn't make me hugely popular. It's probably like <laughs> probably like not career suicide, but like I probably lost some fans. But I didn't mind because it was very. But honest. did you make it funny? No, it was funny. But it was like hard but hitting. It was, but it was too real for some people. I guess, but that's that's fine, you know, because I feel like if you watch somebody put out their opinion on Ireland's relationship with alcohol and how much Irish identity and alcohol are intertwined and how that's a negative thing, right. if you watch that and you end up hating that person because they've said it, it says more about you than about the person. Right, okay. You know? And and I I feel like I've lived in Ireland long enough, not to mention consider myself Irish all my life, to have the right to say it. So that was totally fine. And if it's online, like if one watches it, you will see that actually like there's no need to be upset about it. You know? Right. It's just like looking at a thing and saying it's the same way as if you watch a documentary about Americans are getting too fat. Right. And you know. Fat people are going to be like, fuck this shit. Yeah, of course. <laughs> fuck I, this bullshit. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I, 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 what I'm is, fat because I'm American. <laughs> right. And I'm allowed to be fat. Right. It's my right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, long story short, uh, yes, there is a lot of drinking in Ireland. However, not being a drinker there is not any more difficult than anywhere else. Because okay. once you once you tackle the not drinking, it's actually pretty easy to be a non-drinker. What, what's the, the drinking age? 18. Oh, it is 18? So it's not one of those countries where the kids are sitting around drinking no, vodka. No, like no. That's more like it, European. That's yeah. more to do with the wine. That's amazing. With the wine culture. But I think Spain is 16. But Ireland is Ireland is 18. Do you miss it? Booze? Yeah. It's hard to know, man. 23 years. But but you don't get the... Nah, very, every now and then I, I, I just feel like it's an inconvenience. You know, in the sense that perhaps you don't have the, the mating ritual right. with, uh, with new people. Or... You know, you won't be part of the... Like, there's say there's, like, a crew of guys at the cellar. I'm good buddies with them. Right. Uh, and I'm not saying which ones, you know, so nobody has to start trying to guess. And I, I'm good buddies with all of them. But every now and then they have their little sessions. Right. You know? And obviously I'm just... It's not like they're not inviting me. I just have no desire to be there. It's, like, right. no fun for me. Right, right. Uh, but they're probably closer as a result of that than, than I am with them because of, and you know but there's not that's like a, but you're also in the right profession there's a lot of comics that don't drink a yeah lot, a lot of sober comics man no I mean I, I know loads of, I mean yeah. it, 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 there's no problem you just, I'm just giving do an you example do, do you smoke pot no nah, I'm, no, so, so I'm you, a totally like, clean guy because when we were talking, one vice <laughs> what's the vice getting on stage ladies no <laughs> it's getting on stage is a vice. total consensual by the way but, uh, uh, the getting on stage like, I mean that is kind of a vice too you know well, because need, it is a drug you know getting that response from an audience is absolutely, absolutely could, could be a drug and you gotta sort of be aware of that right no no I mean it totally is I, when you were talking about blacking out and all that I, I wanted to go on a speech about how uh, you know alcohol is way worse than pot because you said you went to... Alcohol is clearly worse than pot. But I'll argue that all day. Isn't it amazing in the States, though, we have decided that pot is this evil drug, but alcohol is okay? That was a big theme in this series that I made. Oh, really? In fact, I made the, uh, the, the physical joke. I went to a supermarket. For real, we filmed it. I filled up my shopping trolley with booze. Yeah. And then I tried to buy two bottles of Tylenol. We don't, the, the, the brand is different in Ireland, but sure. two bottles of Tylenol. And you're not allowed. You can only buy one. <laughs> but it was literally five to six hundred euros worth of booze yeah. and twenty dollars worth of Tylenol. The and I was only allowed to buy ten dollars worth of Tylenol. The hypocrisy. And then there's still guys, you know, in our government trying to slow down the whole pot train. And I'm like, I'd rather see the pot be legalized all over America than than the damn booze. Honestly, man, I don't drink. I don't do drugs. But I, 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 I actually, I, I'm for decriminalizing all drugs. And but I. I, I think there's a trade-off. I think if you decriminalize all drugs, consumption will rise. Right. Uh, but I think the harm will decrease. That's, uh, yeah, that's a fair point. But yeah, I think I there's harm that. that comes with the increase in consumption. But I think in general for society, right. I think the harm for individuals might increase, but the harm for society will decrease right. immeasurably, in my opinion. See, I'm going the other way. So as I get older, I don't like booze as much, but sliding back in a pot after taking like, 20 some odd years off thanks to Joe fucking Rogan fuck you Joe oh, he loves he loves he loves well, talking I, about the pot I was panicking because I I didn't I, no drugs nothing a little out not even drinking isn't that much with me but I went on his uh, podcast and the lead up I'm like you know he tries to get everyone high right and I'm like oh really 
I mean, he's not forcing it. You know, you're your own person in the end. But there's definitely a little bit of a pressure there. And uh, it was 20 years. And leading up to me being on Joe Rogan, I'm like, fuck, I know he's going to ask me. And I'm panicking. And I'm sitting there. And he's like, come on up. Just a little. Come on. He's blowing smoke at me a little bit. Just having fun with it. And then I, uh, I took a little baby hit. Calmed me down. I, I had a decent appearance with him. And then... Uh, you know, I'm back. <laughs> well, I mean, but I don't, I, I don't regret it. I don't, I, you know what I mean? I, I, I feel like this is a good thing, if that makes sense. I, listen, maybe I shouldn't be saying that to you. No, listen, man, here's what I think. I, I, I don't smoke weed because I, I just have like a personality where, where I, uh, you know, it, it seems to lead to other things. But uh, I do drink coffee though. And I know it seems odd to make that comparison, but. I, for some reason, I can control my consumption of coffee in that I enjoy the charge in the morning, sometimes right. the charge in the evening. Right. And I don't really see how smoking weed is really that much different to that. I don't... I mean, I... I yeah, I'm not like a pothead here. No, I know. So I don't really... I don't have any problem with anybody's consumption of anything, really. Once it doesn't get out of control, and once it's not a cost to our society. Right. So my problem with, like, the overconsumption of alcohol in Ireland is it's costing our society. You know, health service, you know, uh, safety at night, uh, safety of individuals, you know, and, and, and there's a high cost to alcohol consumption, but for some reason we accept that cost. Right. Yeah. You know? There's a very low cost to marijuana consumption. I'm, I'm not oblivious to the yes. harm of it, but yeah. the harm is low. Yes, 100%. So I, you know, no. th there is a total, but you know, I mean, obviously th th there's guys well more versed in it than me, but it all goes back to racism. Well, there's all sorts of shit that goes with right. people's fear of marijuana. Right, 100%. You know, as I sit here in your, old, your mom's old house, now your house, I'm like, oh God, this this pot and alcohol talk. I'm gonna I'm gonna read about it. Well, the last <laughs> joint I ever smoked was with, with that last drink. I'm gonna read with uh, my next door neighbor, who's not here now, but he stopped drinking three months later. Oh, okay. Both of us haven't drank since then. But, I'm just uh, nervous after this conversation. I'm gonna read about you three months. Not enough. a chance, bro. <laughs> okay, good, good. I've had plenty. Of, <laughs> right, I've good. had plenty of. Uh, I've right, had good. plenty of. Uh, no, I'm very pot like. I have no problem with uh, with with dr like I I'm really a fan of legalizing drugs actually right. because I I. I I see the harm with the criminality associated with drug distribution. I, I think it would put a huge dent in that to, to, sure. to legalize it. Um, one other question. I, I found out, I was just doing a little research on you, even though I, I sort of know you. you. You're a big Bill Hicks fan? Well, that's one, I think that's my, well, I, I'll just say my, uh, in my top five. Really? Yes. Well, the Bill Hicks thing was more like, I started doing comedy, I'd never heard of Bill Hicks. Like a lot of Americans. Who were your guys? Well, growing up, it was, I was I was an Eddie Murphy guy. I don't know if everyone likes to admit that, but I mean, I, I could... Why is it bad to admit that? No, I don't know. But, you know, I, I think like a lot of comics like to try to act like they're cooler than they are. But like Eddie Murphy was like... Eddie Murphy was a god when I was... God to me. And and what is bothersome about him is that he never really went back to stand-up. No. I mean, he had that huge movie career and all, but could you imagine the type of freaking comedy that Eddie Murphy would be doing? Especially today with... With Trump and all this other stuff that you could really have fun uh, goofing I on. I mean, I worshipped him, man. I mean, we watched over and over and over, Raw and Delirious. Delirious like, couldn't amazing. watch it enough. Right. So he was the, I guess, the biggest when I was a kid. Plus, all the in the late '80s, there was just so much comedy on TV. I can't name the guys, but I used to just love watching stand up. Right. But I, I loved Richard Pryor too. Sure. And. I, I, I liked Richard Jenny because we had Showtime and he had a Showtime special. Right. Most of them had HBO specials, but he had a Showtime special. So I loved Richard Jenny. Yes. And, uh, you know, I guess other guys that I saw. But what, when I started doing comedy, I, you know, all the Europeans were into Bill Hicks. Mm. So I rented Bill Hicks specials from Laser Video in Dublin. And then I became like, I used to pray to Bill Hicks before getting on stage. Wow. I, I, I used to pray to, for him to give me the strength to have the courage to talk about those things, you know? Right. And uh, I mean, I've moved on from that time now, but at the time, I, I, I but that's a good, that's a good guy to be stuck on for a while, Bill Hicks. And then at once or twice, like, I would get reviews where they'd be like, oh, you know, Hicks like, and I'd be like, yes, finally. But, but, but in saying that, Here's my problem with European comedians' obsession with Bill Hicks. In that era, people have, you know, it's a little different now, but uh, a lot of guys would be really critical of America. These British guys would be really critical of America, and then people would go, Hicks-like. And I'd be like, no, no, no. What was great about Hicks was he was saying that to people in fucking Virginia. Right. You're saying it to a bunch of people at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. They're already won over. Right. So one of the things I think, I mean, I don't like admitting this because it's like, to me, the booze series, funnily enough, just because we mentioned it, 
that was not that popular with Irish people. Okay. But to me, that's Hicks life. Yeah. I've done. I did material about the Iraq War. You know, the second. You know, the second Iraq War. And you know, post 9/11, I did some tough stuff about America. But it's very popular in Europe. I don't think that, that people say that's Hicks like. I don't think it is because you're you're preaching to the fucking sure. converted. Yeah, people don't realize Bill Hicks would say this uh, to an audience that was, didn't want to hear it. No, and he knew that, and it and it just got him off to go even further. Yeah, he was he was he was something a great special. comic. It's very sad that he died. You know, very he early. was very challenging, and I, I and I think guys like Bill Bird, you know, nowadays, they're they have a Hicks like energy because they. Touch on subjects that are particularly when, particularly with his style. Yes. He likes to start yes. in a really tough spot. <laughs> yes. And it's the working out of that tough spot that is entertaining. I, I, I mean this in a very nice way because I've known Burr over the years. He, he's a sick person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I say that lovingly because he, he would love to get himself in just a horrible hole, like you said, from the get go, and then try to figure out how to get out of it. How to get out of it, yeah. And also, uh, I mean, did, you Stan know, Hope is like. Stan Hope is awesome. Now, now awesome. Stan Hope, like, again, the subject matter, it's, it's hard to compare the subject matter because Hicks was of his time. But, you know, Stan Up is that otherworldly guy that's basically saying what the consensus may not be uh, acceptable. Right. And that's what Hicks was doing at the time, yeah. too. Now, obviously, the consensus changes, society changes. Sure. So, it, that, I mean, people say that is the comedian's job. And that's why, like, whether people like Michelle Wolf or not, that's why Michelle Wolf to me is Hicks like because she does challenge the consensus. Yeah, it, it, it takes balls to do that. It takes that's, a lot of fucking. That's not balls. easy to do, man. Not easy, man. Yeah, it takes a lot of balls. You know the Bill Burr story in Philly with you guys, of yeah. course. I feel like you guys. I don't know if that that I don't know if that event gets enough credit for launching his career. But I, I always tell people that I think that was the beginning of his meteoric rise. Uh, I I would say so. I wish there was a better copy of that. I know someone. At Live Nation has to have a, a board copy of that from the board, and I would love to get that out there because there's there's a bad version. But how it goes, we did this uh, comedy festival back in the day, uh, Opie and Anthony, and Bill Burr was not well known, and he was sort of just becoming popular on the radio show, but not as much. And and our audience back there, they were tough. They, yes. they were tough. But then when they finally accepted you, forget it. They'll go to every show, you know, and they'll support you right to the end. But Burr was having a tough time in Philly. He was the third guy on. It was uh, Don Marrera. I know. Who should kill, right? And then it was uh, Jimmy Schubert, who's from Philly. Those Played two- at my club in Beijing. Really? Schubert? Schubert came to Beijing. Because I ran an English language night, too. But he played it. He played it? Yeah. So, I mean, I laugh at this, but uh, Schubert bombed in front of his family that were sitting pretty much in, the front <laughs> row in Philly in front of like 15,000 people. For some reason, we all found that hilarious. I, I guess because we're all sick you know, yeah, inside, yeah, yeah. you know, because I love Jimmy Schubert and I want him to do it. But well. you also know that he's a good comic, so right. it's not like you're insulting but him. But a lot of us, uh, a lot of us after the show, we were like going through the scenario that he had to go out to uh, breakfast the next day with his family and they know that he just bombed in front of 15,000 people and how that would be. We Such would, an awkward, I hate bombing yeah, and then having to be with the yeah, people. Yeah, you know, and we wanted to be a fly on the wall as he's trying to have breakfast in, with his family after bombing in Philly. But anyway, uh, I, I was next to Bill Burr backstage, so Schubert bombed because the crowd wasn't having it. They were, they, to them, it was a, a huge party, too. And, I, I mean, Jimmy Schubert should not have bombed is what I'm trying to say, uh, you know. And then Don Marrero, who's a seasoned comic, he bombs. From Philly. And, and oh, he's from Philly originally? Yeah, he's from Philly. Everyone thinks he's from New York. He's a Philly guy. I did guy. not know that. Okay. Yeah. And I'm, I'm next to Bill Burr, and there's a bunch of us backstage, and he's just pacing. And he's like, they ain't fucking doing this to me. They ain't fucking doing this. He's panicking, but also getting really worked up. Goes out there. And the first couple minutes, they won't even let him get jokes out. I mean, I've they, heard it, so I know. Yeah, that. so they're now like, fuck, boo, right away. Because now they, they feel like they're controlling the whole show. And that and the audience is now getting off on that. And the rest is history. Then he decided to just take on Philly in general and trash He's everything. He's not even a real guy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and the amazing part of it was seeing Bill just dig in and go, fuck you. I'm doing every minute of my time. I think they had like 20 minutes back then. And there was a clock, and he would be saying, yeah, there's five That's minutes. Right, I got right. five minutes left, and they're still booing, and he's making fun of Rocky and the Flyers yeah. and everyone he could think of. And then to watch the turn was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. I'm not joking. In my life, 
all of a sudden he said something and there was like a little like chuckle a little like and then you watch this crowd that wanted to hate him just completely turn and by the end of it they give him a fucking standing ovation oh they gave him a standing ovation a standing ovation and Bill Burr the rest is history. I know. Not that he didn't have the talent to begin with, but no, like you said, that just catapulted. No, but I remember him. because he came to Ireland years ago to do the Cat Laughs Comedy Festival. Right. And so I met him. Yeah, we've been talking for ages. And uh, then I didn't hear of him again until that. Really? And that was, the, and then from then on, all I ever did was hear about him. Yeah. You know the other side of that? So then when, our next stop, I think, was Cleveland. And, you know, we're a big radio show and stuff, so we now tell everybody what happened in Philly. And everyone in Cleveland, we're trying to get that to happen again. So Bill Burr went out, and they started booing him. And he's just like, what are you, what are you I did this kidding? already. Yeah, but nah, whatever. But that, that was the other side of it. But well, you, you had some crazy fans back in the day. Uh, to this day, yeah. They're, <laughs> they're insane. They're rapid, The Opie and Anthony they're, crowd. They're passionate, man. They hate that me and Anthony aren't doing radio anymore. Yeah, and they're picking sides and all this crap, and I sit there like just enjoy what we were able to accomplish, man. It's I've nuts. been on, I've been on his show too. Yeah, yeah. But you guys are different guys. Totally different. Well, yeah. I mean, the problem is, I mean, there's a lot of problems at this point, but uh, we just grew apart, man. I mean, we we lasted way longer than I think we should have. I did you know, it with him and Artie. It's very hard to get a word in. <laughs> <laughs> Artie's very funny though, man. Artie's funny. He's funny, but it's hard. To, and when he gets in his flow, it's hard. You gotta. It's hard to fit in with his flow, man. He's fucking. How many times did he walk out as uh, as he was on the show? Oh, he walked a lot, but only just to pee or whatever. The uh, fuck. Well, no, no, no. I, 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 he, I love Artie. I'm not. I, I don't want to trash him. <laughs> I wish... Yeah, well, I, he, he's been at the cell. You know, he's doing crashing and everything. So he's been in. He, he, he's in a good place these days. Hopefully, it appears so. Yeah. Oh, good, good. It appears so. Yeah, I, I miss doing radio with him. He's he he was doing radio with me at, uh, at the end there, and actually the company wanted wanted uh, us to team up. And I was like, I, I, I knew the issues, and I'm like, it's I tough, can't. yeah. I mean, but he is a great, he's a great, he's chatter. amazing, yes. All right. And he's just so naturally funny. Yeah. He literally just doesn't speak a sentence that's not funny. No, no, he's one of those. He's guys. got a joke about everything. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like yeah. I, I, I don't know if there's other things to talk about in life, so I guess you can't be funny all the time. But he just seems to have right. everything's funny, right? Because a lot of stand-ups, uh, not a lot. I shouldn't say that, but you know, there's stand-ups that have. Very funny sets, but aren't funny people. Yes. I, and that was the one thing I had to learn when I was doing a radio show, because I would bring guys in, I don't need to name names, and I'm like, wow, that guy's set is hilarious. I gotta get him on the radio. And then he comes in and, and he's just a stiff. Yeah, well, but he knows how to, the radio. But he knows how to write really good stand-up. And then there were other guys that weren't great writers, that were just hilarious in the room, and then you would go to Caroline's or whatever to see him, and like, how is this the same? guy it was weird how that worked yeah because well, I, I think radio i think it's a little bit of a different skill you think there's like uh, intimidation and i don't know i just think radio you just have to be a good fucking conversation right yeah you know stand up attracts a lot of people that are weird and some of those weird people find a funniness in their weirdness but their weirdness doesn't translate to like four guys sitting around right shooting the shit you guys are a unique breed <laughs> i try so, to be the most normal I, you come across that way. I try to be like the most normal of the I, comics. I, I, I was uh, doing research, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm just mumbling to myself. I know there's something wrong with him. I'll find it. Oh, they, they, trust me, there's something I'm wrong. Kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I got, I, I'll line up twenty girlfriends to tell you, fucking right, this okay. guy. There's something wrong with this guy, man. No, man. You were pretty open today. I love it. Uh, one last thing, and I'm, maybe we can do it. Maybe we can't. You doing uh, jump around in Chinese that has oh, made yeah. it all over the internet. And you do it in Gaelic and and in Chinese. Do the club, do the veil. Ace name a scale. Look how it's a good ticket to Tom to Kuna Gale. Tom Shung Yin, Kobo, Ying Shang, go to Bow and Tongwa Ya, Ika Cook out, the Jawa, Najo How, Shimbe Kawa Shao, Dajaza Ichi Lai, Chow we chow, Dum and Fun Kwan Tao, take a fun quan of Buddha, Dajaza Ichi Kwan Tao, Kwan Tao, Kwan Tao, Kwan Tao, Dajaza Ichi Kwan Tao. Yeah, well, I did it originally for the Gaelic show. Right. And then it became a thing. Right. But that actually, the great thing about the Irish version of it was that, like, people know that song. Like, sure. they, if I If I did that song live, a lot of the crowd would, like, know it. Right. Because it became big in the, all these, all these second, the high school kids, a lot of them go away for three weeks of the summer to help learn Irish. Right. So that's, like, one of the songs that they all okay. dance to. So that's, like, that's, like, a song people know. 
the Chinese version is just for fun because the Chinese people have no cultural connection to jump around. You know, we do. So it's like a huge song. Oh, it made, it made me laugh out loud. Don't you have a podcast? I haven't checked it out. I have, but I haven't been uh, updating it as of late. Why, man? Because I'm a lazy bastard. <laughs> and you're enjoying your summer out here. No, but also, I'm sure you've noticed this with doing the podcast. Like, obviously, today you organize this with me yourself. It's the admin. Right. It's not the podcasting. It's the admin. Right. Do you have anyone helping you? You probably do. Yeah, yeah. I got a few people. You're probably getting paid, too, right? A little bit. Yeah, I wasn't getting motherfucking paid. That's why. <laughs> yeah, but it helps promote shows. No, no. Podcasts are great. No, I loved it, man. But honestly, part of the problem with my podcast was, I, you know, because I'm well-known in Ireland, as an Irish podcast, it was killing it. Right. But when I moved here, I started talking more to American comics. It would, literally, the listenership would just like drop by half, which was totally fine. But after a while, it was just like... I think when I do, I'm going to start a new podcast, and when I do, I'll make clear what it is, yeah. but I'll start it in America and let it grow that way. All right, there you go. You know? I think you should be doing it, man. You got a lot to say. Oh, no, no. I, I definitely will be doing it. I, I have some ideas. I thought I'd come by for a little quick little uh, conversation with yeah, you when we talked for an hour and a half. Hour and a half later. Yeah. What do you want to promote, man? So what do I got coming up? I got, I'm in Phoenix. What is that? House of Comedy in Phoenix. Uh, Labor Day weekend. Thursday to Saturday. Then I'm in a DC Draft House, September 21st, and I'm in Edmonton nice. uh, at the end of September. Very nice. Those are my American dates. Then I got some Irish stuff coming up. And your Instagram, I see you on at the beach. Des Bishop, D E S B I S H O P. Yeah. You like the Instagram? Well, I got no choice. It's the <laughs> it's the one that matters at the moment, you know. Absolutely. I got a great Twitter following, a great Facebook following, but it's just not as important as my less uh, Instagram following. I think Instagram is way more important. I, I, Twitter's just become a cesspool, unfortunately. Very angry. So uh, I push my Instagram at Des Bishop. Plus, Instagram's very good for the for the DMs, you know. Oh, Can't, for the ladies. For the ladies. You my only vice. Do you got a lady in your life? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and uh, and uh, well, I'm on Raya. I'm on the celebrity Tinder. So that's, that's what is that all? Oh, about? Uh, that, that's the next podcast, yo. Really? I'll tell you about Raya. But you're married, right? Yeah. But I mean, oh, that's good timing. Hey, there's one of my ladies right here. Hey. <laughs> No, this is Amy She's actually an Irish actress. Oh, really? Yeah, it's fine. Come in. I didn't know you were here. I thought you were away. Oh, yeah, we were recording the podcast. So, Wait, uh, she didn't know you were here, but just walked no, in the she, house? No, I think I had said that we were going to be like walking around. Or something. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, so, Opie. Hi, in a great, In a great Irish uh, drama series called Love Hate, which if anybody ever gets a chance to watch. <laughs> She's scared of this. So, this thing doesn't I, bite. I just turn into Dougal. I'm like, hello, hi. She's even, she's even using references that nobody will know about. Nobody's that's a reference to Father Ted. That's actually quite funny if he's new. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. No, yeah, that, that's this, that's my cue to get the hell out of here. This is one of my hoes. No, just I should back. go. <laughs> I was just going to go for a wait. Did you just call me ho? I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> so funny. So you're going to go for a wee? I'm going to go for a wee. Okay, great. All, right. All good podcasts finish. Oh, that's a great way to finish. With a woman pee. <laughs> Des has a whole uh, show up. That's how we end this. Oh, my God. You no, she's a great actress, actually. You rule, Des uh, Bishop. I've been wanting to do this for a while, so thank oh, you so thanks, much, man. buddy. Thanks for having me. Thanks All right. so much. All right. Oh, I liked her voice. Great guest, talented comic. Go to desbishop.net for his new podcast, live dates, and more. Follow him at Des Bishop on Twitter and Instagram. And leave us a comment on this episode. Rate us five stars. Share the link with a friend. Get a hat or shirt at opiradio.com. And thanks for subscribing. I'd like to personally thank Opie for not calling attention to that Mr. Soft the Ice Cream Truck theme around the 106 mark. We know how much he loves podcast sounds on Opie Radio.